chairman and esteemed fellowship plus awardees you know this our first prime minister pandit jawaharlal nehru has said once that everything can wait but agriculture <laughs> so thank you for waiting for so long and uh, i'm really pleased and honored to get this chance to present Uh, my work at this insa anniversary meeting and uh, i am actually sorry that dr patak could not come otherwise he would have introduced the topic of climate change and what are various mitigation and adaptation approaches so i have not prepared you know for the introductory part but the only thing i can say is the climate change is real it is happening and it is the climate is warming and the consequences of that are erratic rainfall sometimes you have drought sometimes you can have flooding and the coastal salinity is increasing so it's a very well known fact which all we all can feel so i will not spend time in the uh, introduction part i will come straight away to my specific uh, uh, topic we i will be presenting about my work so at the outset uh, i would like to acknowledge the funding support from department of biotechnology and indian council of agriculture research i received some major funding uh, from these two organizations to do my work and i'm continuing to do so as a national professor uh, maybe for another year or so so this is the outline of my presentation first i will introduce very briefly what is genomics i think many of these things you already know so you forgive me uh, if i tell you what you already know but i have to put things in the perspective then uh, decoding of the rice genome and example of gene gene discovery and use in rice breeding and i will talk a little bit more detail about the uh, marker assisted breeding for development of climate resilient varieties which is a kind of adaptation strategy uh, for the climate change then search for new genes in the wild rice germplasm and future challenges in way forward so genome was defined more than 100 years back as the complete set of genetic information present in a single haploid cell of an organism including its protoplasm that means the mitochondrial and chloroplast genome also by a german scientist botanist hans winkler so this is the definition which holds to even today this is a complete set of genetic information so why do we need to do this thing why it is important to do genomic research because in the beginning it was actually many people were not in favor of this because it is very costly to sequence the genomes it costs huge amount and we could not see that what what going to be the practical application of this thing but now more and more it is coming that it is almost essential to have a genome sequence of uh, any commodity or organism which we are dealing with or which are useful to us so the very first uh, utility is the the very basic aspect Uh, once we have the complete physical map physical map is the genome sequence is the physical map of an organism then we can understand the evolutionary and phylogenetic relationships among different species on the planet earth how far back uh, there was a common ancestor 
and how they are different from each other. In fact, all these species present on the Earth, they are related by descent, and that could be very well visualized once you have the complete physical map. Then going, coming down to the practical side, once we have the genome sequence, then we can have high-density fingerprints uh, for the conservation effort, for the IPR protection of the germplasm resources. Uh, under the International Biodiversity Treaty, you know, the, the germplasm uh, is the resource. It is a property of a people who have preserved them. So if you want to claim the right, you have to have very high-density fingerprint to prove that the material belongs to you. Then coming further down, having the genome information helps you to identify, to discover the new genes. Uh, if anybody will do the piracy of germplasm, why, why they will do? Because they want to mine genes from that. It will be useful for a particular purpose, and they can make business with them. So this having genome information is just like having a GPS in your hand. Uh, it was talked that the, everything is in the mobile. So GPS is also in the mobile, and you go and find any place. You don't have to ask anybody. Uh, you know, you, you can board the taxi and reach to your destination without uttering a single word to with anybody. So this uh, genome information helps to identify the gene and to actually and then characterize it. Then it is also a breeding tool, as a selection tool. So the conventional breeders, they used to select by a physical observation a particular type of plants to develop new varieties. But now more and more, those breeders are using molecular assisted breeding. And having the genome information always helps you for the foreground and background selection. Then the latest tool in plant breeding is the genome editing which in, in my view is going to replace the conventional breeding maybe in five to 10 years, because it, it can do the same thing what con conventional breeders does. That is recombination and the individual gene, either you substitute different alleles or you have assortment of allele, all can be done through the genome editing uh, much more precisely and much faster. So we need to design guide and in that, if you want to be targeting the gene for genome editing, you make sure that if there is no um, homology with the background, this target specificity can be ensured only if you have the genome information. Without genome information, we cannot do that besides guide RNA synthesis. So in this particular side here, I want, uh, I want to uh, give a brief overview of gene discovery and utilization process flow and timeline. Uh, which is the essence of the plant building, really. See, the, first of all, we have to discover the trait. We have to discover, no matter which particular crop or commodity we are working on, uh, the genes are there uh, in the biodiversity. And this biodiversity has been well adapted to different kinds of climatic conditions. I will, I will give you an example in case of rice here, uh, which is the main focus of my talk. Despite so much progress in science, nobody has synthesized any gene de novo. And even there is no need to synthesize because all kinds of genes are already there. We only have to discover and utilize them. So genes are there in the uh, germplasm, which is the land race, traditional varieties, wild relatives. These are all present, which have all kinds of genes. And in fact, if you are using the genetic engineering technology, GM technology, then you can you can find gene from any species and put in your desired species. Uh, to find the gene, the first step is to do trait discovery. Suppose you are looking for a particular trait, like salt tolerance or drought tolerance. We have to screen high throughput evaluation uh, of the germ plant for the target trait. So this is, a, a, again, activity, a very much a scientific activity. We have to devise the methods of screening where you can screen large number of genotypes uh, in a very short time to identify the particular genotype, have that particular trait value. But mostly, uh, one variety will not have all the traits. In fact, the breeder's objective is to combine as many good, good traits as possible in a single genotype, and that becomes the mega variety. So once we find that, then we can go for the gene discovery. For that, we have to have a structured population. Uh, Usually it will be biparental or multiparental. I am not going into detail, but 
the population has to be structured. Then only you can identify the gene using the functional genomics tools. And then uh, we identify the genes, we go back to the germplasm and look for the best alternate form of the gene, the best allele. Because every gene will have hundreds of alleles. When the Mendel dis uh, you know, discovered the gen science of genetics, uh, uh, father of the genetics, then he described only two alleles for each trait. And dominant and recessive, tall and dwarf, you know, red and white. But now we know that at molecular level, the dominant, there's nothing like dominance. At molecular level, only co-dominance is there. And the, every gene has got hundreds of alleles, not only one or two alleles. And in sequence, even single nucleotide polymorphism will create a different allele. It may or may not have a consequence at the morphological level, but the numbers of alleles are numerous. So we can go back to germplasm, we do targeted sequencing and identify the superior alleles. And then we can combine through molecular breeding. The breeding population, again, is a different population. It could be, again, biparental or multiparental, but the population has to be large. Then only the right combination of genes will be there. And then we can use these selection tools like uh, mass or marker assisted by cross breeding, genomic selection. So large number of tools are selection tools are also coming. So you can see here, then only this product reaches uh, to the producer and the consumers. This is the chain, this is called the value chain from production to consumption. The producer is the farmers and the consumers are us. In between the processors are also there, they need particular quality. So this is the whole chain is there. From, it starts from the biodiversity and ends with the uh, consumers and uh, producer. And here the genomics is playing its role in, in throughout, right from the gene discovery to molecular breeding. Uh, I will give you some of these examples here, uh, particularly in rice, the work which we have been doing. So uh, regarding the genome sequencing or decoding, uh, the first time India participated, that was in 2000, with the Rice Genome Project when we joined it along with the South Campus Delhi University and our institute. Before that, the internationally Human Genome Project was there and Arabidopsis Genome Project was there where India was not a partner when these things were taking shape in 1990s. And our next door neighbor, China, was very much there right from the beginning. So they were at least five years ahead of us in genomics, and now they are much more ahead with the Beijing Genomics Institute, the kind of investment they have put in. Uh, but then, nonetheless, it is never too late, so we, we joined and we sequenced the chromosome 11. I'm not going into detail here. We finished our job ahead of the schedule, despite that we had to start from the scratch. So we got the training and learned and did it in two, 2002. The draft sequence was uh, published and then it took another three years to finish the sequence. So finishing is a slow process and it was published in Nature in 2005, so uh, nearly 17 years. And this is the forerunner part of the genome in the, any crop plants. And rice, that's why the rice is also forerunner in the application of genomics in breeding. So there are many um, varieties have been now released using this genomics assisted breeding. And other crops will actually follow. So this is the, uh, in the third part of my presentation. I will just give only one example. And there are many examples, more than 300 examples like that, where the genes have been identified. First the material was identified having the particular trait value and then Using the genomics assisted tool, the gene has been discovered and it has been used in the breeding. So at uh, IRI and in our institute, we discovered, uh, we identified these three, um, uh, three genotypes with the, having the trait value. The one is here with the new plant type having uh, more than 400 grains per panicil as compared to this green revolution variety, which is Jaya, uh, which gave the gene revolution. But we don't know what was the gene behind it. Then the Pusa 1121, this is a variety, very special variety with a very long grain after kernel elongation and all the basmati quality trait. Actually, this earns a huge amount in the foreign exchange in the export. Then there are, variety, there are varieties of rice which are tolerant to salinity and also to drought, but these are not very high yielding. 
So all of these varieties, they have particular traits, but they are missing so many traits also. So for, if you want to use the genomics assisted breeding or marker assisted breeding very precisely, then we need to identify the actual gene behind that trait. And then we can have the gene-based marker and do very precise breeding. Either mass or genome editing. In either case, then we have to identify the genes. And this is a slow process. Genome sequencing is, uh, now it is very fast. But to identify the genes behind a trait, it is not so easy. So maybe around 300 genes have been identified and validated in rice, which was sequenced you know, more than 15 years, 17 years back. The other crops and species where genome sequence is not available, uh, the thing will be very, very slow. So I will just only give you an example of this particular high grain number, which was present in the new plant type. So going through, we developed the population, we mapped it, and then we identified a genomic region, a very small genomic region, uh, which has a major, major QTL for this high grain number. And the candidate genes were uh, identified. One particular gene, protein kinase domain containing protein, uh, it, exp uh, it has got five-fold more expression in the variety which has got high grain number as compared to the, its counterpart with the low grain number. Now using the marker assisted foreground and background selection, we transferred this particular gene into 12 different varieties, different mega variety of rice. I will come to that, what is a mega variety? They are, uh, I will not do it here, but in the next slide I will explain. Here, I just want to tell you that these are very well established varieties, and this particular gene increased the grain number in each of these backgrounds. There's significant increase. There was a variable, but significant increase in each of these varieties. So this particular gene is very useful to increasing the grain yield. So foreground, this is foreground selection and agarose gel. This is the, the first one will be the uh, low grain number. This is lower one is the high grain number. And then for background selection, background selection has to be done the genome-wide. So we developed a chip, SNP chip, with 50,000 uh, SNP probes representing all the 12 chromosomes. And using this particular chip, we were able to select the background. We said first selected visually, and then on the short listed uh, maybe 20 lines, we applied these particular tools because it will be quite expensive to apply on the large number of uh, material. Uh, but within that uh, selected set of 20 lines, we could select the best line, which has got maximum recovery of background. So even visually you select similar looking plants, still there is about 10 to 20% variation, which you don't see with your eye. So for that, you have to apply these high density tools. <coughs> this is one example, variety 1121 plus this 4.1 QTL. Here is the, you can see the QTL, and the rest of the background has been recovered, except one or two places here. If it has any negative impact on the performance, then we can do one more by class and eliminate it. So normally you can see if you use the conventional breeding, you have to cross uh, six, seven times, sometimes eight, nine times to recover this kind of background. But with marker assisted within two by class, two to three by class, you can get the same result because you are doing marker assisted selection. Now, one of those variety, one of those 12 varieties, which has been nominated for a CRIP trial this year, and this is in the Samba Masuri, which is a very popular variety. This was developed by Bapatla Research Station here in Andhra Pradesh. And it is very popular among the farmers of the Eastern and Southern India for the last 30 years, over 30 years. So sometimes we say that we will develop a new variety and we ask farmer to, you know, discontinue old one and take the new one, but farmers have their own mind. Unless you have a really better product, they will not replace it. So many of these old varieties, they keep on cultivating uh, because of its uh, adaptability and also the yield and this quality aspects and different aspects. So here uh, you can see here the number of grains uh, is more than doubled and they are all well-filled grains. And uh, this is the original Samba Masuri. This is the, you can transfer this one gene, then the number of grains is just doubled. They are all well-filled. 
The number of tiller is reduced slightly, but even there's a 15% yield increase. Uh, if you do everything same, same amount of fertilizer, irrigation, everything in the same field, head-to-head -head trial, we have done for the last four years, there's a 15% higher yield with just a single gene. And you can see it has a pleiotropic effect. Now, uh, the, the fourth uh, part of my presentation, I think I am going all right with the time. Uh, using this particular approach, the back cross breeding, marker assisted back cross breeding, because there are several approaches of breeding, marker assisted selection means you pedigree breeding, you take two varieties and cross it and they select the best combination. Then there is genomic selection, there are other kinds of recurrent selection. The marker assisted back cross breeding has given the maximum results here because uh, you start with a well adapted variety and then you put one or two genes which are missing there which will add value to that. And that has worked very well. I'm not going into detail the science behind it, why this has worked and others have not worked so well. Uh, in, in summary, the essence is that these varieties, say breeders have released more than 2,000 varieties, or even higher number of rice varieties during the last uh, you know, 30, 40 years. But not more than 50 varieties are accepted by the farmers for a very long time. Because these are the rare combination of alleles. You have uh, 37,000 genes in rice, and each have different alleles. If you go for the combination, the number of permutation combinations are actually limitless. In fact, uh, the, the uh, entire inverse, you know, will finish before you see all the combination. So I was just calculating <coughs> that even only just the 24 genes are segregating independently. Rice has 12 chromosomes. So if you take two genes on each chromosome and each telomere, which will recombine freely, and the 12 chromosomes will assert independently. So 24 genes, if you take one on each chromosome arm, they will assert randomly according to Mendelian thing. So 24 genes, you will get more than 17 million combinations. So if you, if you cross Swarna, the good variety, or Samba Masuri with any variety, to get to the original Swarna, only one out of 17 million combinations will be like the original Swarna. So when you, once you cross it, you, you, know, you disturb the whole apple cart, and then you cannot get back. But the good thing is that with the back cross breeding, in one back cross, you restore half of those, uh, you eliminate half of the undesirable ones, then the next cross you again eliminate half. So without counting, the back cross building is such a strategy that you can restore your original best combination within two to three back crosses, more than 90%. So whenever breeder takes a, want to transfer a gene from an undesirable background, like a grassy material or something low yielding, Usually, they have to make, uh, you know, two to three back crosses. So many breeders, they, they don't like to do it. They just like to cross the good with the good so that they, they can select the better one from there. And still, even if you cross good with the good, uh, Dr. J.P. Singh is here, <laughs> the breeder, you know, so many undesirable will be still there, and you have to select. So back cross breeding, that's why it is successful, and it is needed because the good genes are there in the un, uh, unadapted background, the low yielding background. So we have no choice, but we have to transfer, and the back class building is the most e effective way of doing this. So we, we developed this project, and th uh, once again, DBT funded in a big way, uh, more, than, more than 17 crore in the first phase, the second phase again, seven crore. So it is some around 30 crore project with uh, more than 15 institutions, of course, in the network mode. So we started to develop these climate resilient varieties. Uh, with these 15 institutions, mostly focusing on droughts, uh, submergence, and salinity tolerance. Because uh, we already have known QTLs and things for that, so we wanted to just transfer because we have the methodology, then why not to use it? See this uh, mega varieties concept which I told you. The mega varieties are the varieties which are grown in more than one million hectares. They are so popular that farmers are growing in a very large area. Uh, and most of these green revolution varieties, these are the green revolution varieties in case of rice like BR11, IR64, MTU1010, it still has the highest breeder seed indent, uh, despite it is more than 30 years old variety. Then Samba Masuri Swarna. 
like that. So farmers are growing these. They were bred for the high input condition. And uh, that's why they don't have the genes for resilience, climate resilience. Many times people, you know, the activists, they criticize the Green Revolution that it has done a lot of damage to us. We lost all our traditional varieties. But they don't understand why we have, we have not lost anything. All of them are preserved in gene bank, in NBPGR. And GPC is the director. More than 4 lakh centuries are there. More than 1 lakh rice varieties are there. So if anybody wants to grow traditional variety, they can take it grow. But nobody will grow them. So only they make the noise. Here, the traditional variety which we were growing earlier, they have good level of stress tolerance and good quality attributes, but they have poor economic performance. So the farmers uh, don't like to, they don't prefer to grow them. But the high yielding variety, they grow. But uh, only thing is that in the high input condition selection, they did not select for this climate resilience. So that's why those genes were lost. Uh, so now they are uh, using the genomics assisted breeding, we can again put it back. We identified those genes for climate resilience and quality. Whatever was lost, we can put it back and combine with the high yield. That is the need of the day. So one example here is the uh, sub-1 gene for submergence tolerance. It was identified in 1970s, the donor line FR13A. This was a line, Indian line from uh, Odisha. It can could tolerate the two weeks of complete submergence. Just like if you, you know, go under water, you will die because of the lack of oxygen. The same happened to rice also. If you have complete submergence, it needs oxygen. But some of these varieties here, they have they hibernate, just like the frog. And then after the flood goes away, again they regenerate. So this gene, this was uh, the material was identified, uh, you know, in 70s. Then it took 20 years to develop breeding lines. But still, it was not transferred into varieties because we didn't know the gene behind it. After the rice genome uh, availability in 2006, the gene was cloned. And within three years, we had this varieties, uh, submergence talent version of Swarna. And it was released through marker assisted breeding. And now it is very popular. They transferred into some more backgrounds here. And uh, many of these varieties have become actually quite popular. Uh, particularly Swanla sub-1 and IR64 sub-1. So this, this was done by IRI, International Rice Research Institute at uh, Philippines, and in collaboration with the Indian also. But uh, now we developed this uh, big project uh, from DBT funding to transfer uh, several of these genes for drought talents, LNT talents, and submergence talents using this same approach and develop these varieties which have got multiple stress tolerance. So this concept paper was published. You can see here is the, if you put one gene for drought talents, this MTU 1010, you can see almost dead and sabagi done, which was supposed to be drought talents. But this, some of these QTLs like chromosome 1, DTY 1.1, the plants are still surviving. So there's an the advantage of developing, these are called near isogenic lines. Like we have the same variety, but just put one gene, rest of the background is same. The advantage of this is that we can release this variety directly because it has already been well tried and tested variety. We have just put one gene to make it better than before. So uh, ICR allows, you know, two years trial only. Still it has to go for two years trial, but instead of three to four years trial in the normal case. And other thing one can do is that when you've got two different nails, you can intercross and then select for the gene pyramid. You pyramid more than two genes, the background still remains the same because if you cross a nail with the nail, the result is still nil. So instead of one gene, now you have two genes, three genes you can put in the same adaptable background. Then you can strategically deploy the resistance genes. So if you put all the resistance genes once at once, then the super race will evolve. The pathogen will, will overcome it and you will have a super race. So better than putting all the genes together, you deploy strategically so that you delay the onset of resistance. That has been done very beautifully in case of wheat and other things. We have many genes for resistance, but we don't put all of them you know, together, just like against your enemy. You don't want to expose all your arsenal at once. You keep something behind. So this is possible. You have different needles with different genes and deployed what is required. And then location-specific deployment. 
of genes. Suppose we will put this sub-1 genes, we will deploy in the area where this flood takes place. There is no need to put it in the area where there is no flood. Because every gene you add, there is some linkage drag behind it or some other things are there. So the nil breeding is a very important activity. And in the rice, it has come. In other crops, also it will come. So here these are these uh, uh, QTLs for drought tolerance, seven QTLs, then submergence, and then salinity. We took this, this project. And what we did at our institute, because we had a large network of, uh, yes, sir, I will finish. We have a large network of the institutions. So there we uh, devised these markers for program selection. And then we passed on the information to them. And then we did only the background selection, and then we uh, developed this project. One of the very important things we did here that the green revolution variety, this is the dwarfing gene, SD1, which brought in the green revolution. Because of the dwarf uh, height, we could give fertilizer and uh, irrigation, and the variety will not large. But what will happen is that this was very tightly linked with the genes for drought, uh, drought sensitivity. So this linkage was actually broken. We had more than 5,000 lines, and the rare identified rare recombination, uh, which was uh, dwarf, and still it was uh, drought tolerant. Whereas this the original swarna here, uh, it, it will die under drought. But this particular, which has recombined uh, this QTL, that means the tolerant allele came from the donor, and the, the dwarfing gene was from the swarna, and then this survived. So you can see this, are, this is called the negative linkage drag. If you want to get a dwarf variety, you are getting this sensitive allele, which was not present in the original, like Nagina 22 and other varieties. So from this uh, program, uh, we have so far released 12 different varieties. And these are all the climate resilient versions of the very highly adapted rice varieties. I'm not going into the detail here. But these have been uh, released during the last three to four years. In fact, this year, six of them were released and notified this year. So you have to have a network program and uh, be you know, at it. You have to have patience. Then only the result comes. OK. These are some of the shots of some of more of these varieties. So this is the last part of my presentation. I will not take more than five years. So. Those were the genes from the traditional varieties, but the, there are many 10 times more genes there in the wild relatives of the crop plants. And the India is the home of the rice where the rice has originated. So we have the wild relative of rice, which naturally intercrosses with the cultivated rice. And then many more varieties are released. So in this particular project, my aim was to uh, first to collect it. And you can see these are the natural habitats of wild rice. If you go in the eastern India mostly, where the development has not taken place, then the biodiversity is there. Wherever development has taken place, there is no biodiversity. The thing was talked about, you know, regarding the tiger and thing. Um, here at yeah, the roadside, we can find a lot of this in the Kaimur district. This is in Ajamgarh, in the Silo Tal. This is also here in uh, Aurangabad. This is in the, I think this thing has gone here. You can see better. Reservation in Dhemaji, in Assam, Brahmaputra Valley. These are the where it is found in abundant. Now it is found even in uh, natural habitats, but not so much abundant is upland rice, what is called. So in the Dharmasala, in Dhamtari, in um, Chhattisgarh, then this is here, Ranchi, Jharkhand, and then Hubali, Dharwar, in the Karnataka. In the upland, uh, we can find this rice is present there. Then uh, this is the which we are more interested in the stress prone areas. You can see in the Unnao district here, it is a sodic soil and it is growing very much. Then this is coastal salinity water, everything you see dry, then the wild rice, some of the wild rice is growing. Then this is the drought affected area, this is the flood affected area. So some strains of wild rice are adapted because nobody is taking care of this, it is taking care of itself. And in the nature, there are plants which are going in the desert also. There are plants which are going in the you know, very low temperature, very less water, very high water. So in the nature, they are adapted to all kinds of situations. And that's why the climate change will bring the extreme conditions. 
So if we can identify the genes which make them cope with the extreme condition, then we can transfer them into the cultivated variety, and then we will be able to cope with the climate change. But uh, this is what is the worrying part is there. It was talked about the biodiversity. Dr. Jhala told this morning about the tiger. It's not only the tiger which is disappearing or the cheetah which is disappeared. A lot of our plant biodiversity is also disappearing and very fast. You can see here that uh, in front of your eye, how it is getting lost. There's a building coming up, housing, a school is coming up, widening of road, industrial park. Everywhere, this rice is getting disappeared. So we have, I have collected more than 1,000, then evaluated them under the control condition, identify many lines which have got trade value. Uh, this is the anaerobic germination, this is submergence, and this is salinity tolerance. Then uh, using the same approach, we can map, say I have developed the population and then map them. I'm showing only one example here for the salt tolerance. Uh, at back class one generation, we do the phenotyping then uh, genotyping using the high density chip which I described then there are, there are five QTLs coming from one of these lines per salt tolerance. Then underlying genes, this is all possible because of the genome is there. Then anaerobic germination, there is a major gene on chromosome 7. And then we have transferred them into uh, acceptable variety like PUSA 1509 here, anaerobic germination, then PUSA 44 high grain number, this is my second last slide, sir. This is the uh, conclusion here. Now I have tried to show you that uh, what is genomics and how it has been useful in gene discovery and utilization in case of rice. Similar things uh, will follow or is following up in other crops also. So what are the challenges? The biggest challenge in my view is the conservation and high throughput evaluation of the germplasm. What is present here in our gene bank, it is not evaluated. And what is present in situ, it is getting lost very rapidly. So we have to do this both. This is the priority number one. Then we have to choose the plants of economic importance where funding will be there because there has to be some return. And then there are many, many such plants like medicinal, aromatic, crop plants, fruit and horticultural, with their genome sequencing not available, but we have to do it. And that technology is available, single molecule sequencing and optical fingerprinting then genotyping arrays, then we can do rna seq for full length transcript, alternate splicing, and all those things. Plant biology is very important for gene discovery. Unless you understand the whole biology, the, how the, the gene is expressing, you cannot discover the gene. Genome sequencing is probably the easiest part in today's term, which was most difficult 20 years back, but now it is the easiest thing. But discover the gene is the most difficult part. And then marker-assisted breeding, the already the tools are available, we can utilize. But this, this, is, this is where the major time is going to go, in the conservation, evaluation, and utilization, making use of the genomics, assist, genomics tools. So I thank you all for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, I will be very much happy to answer. Thank you. We have time for about 10 uh, that's a very good question. Uh, it is from FE matrix. So it is about $10,000 10, for 96 sample. So uh, around six, uh, they can give discount because they have 30% margin. So you can get discount if you order four or five chips. So it's still six, seven lakhs for one plate, 96. But you get huge amount of information, you know, so you can go up to 80,000 SNP on the same price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is true. There, uh, for SNP genotyping, there are three segments are there. One is very few number of SNP and large number of samples. That's where this technology is not suitable. That is, Casper type of assay are suitable there. And then there are mid segment where fewer number of SNP and fewer number of uh, medium number of SNP, medium number of samples. So there is another technology like fluid dyeing and targeted sequencing, uh, agri seq, and this is the highest segment where a very large number of SNP and very few samples. 
So all three have their own utilization. So depending on our requirement, if you want to do diagnostics or you want to do program selection or fine mapping, then go for CASPER assay. If you want to do varietal fingerprinting and other things, uh, monitoring the quality control, spread of varieties, etc., then you go for the medium segment. If you want to go for gene discovery or evaluate uh, this phylogeny, etc., then you go for this segment. So each three has got their own role. So this is. Yes, see the, the word, actually there are two companies which make these chips, Epimetrix and Illumina. So they have a, whether you go for only 2,000 chip or you go for 50,000, the charge is same. So better, you know, <laughs> we'll go for as many as possible because we have to pay the same amount and we get more information. But if you want to get for fewer, then better to out for this medium segment. Yes, yes, I know. Yes, yes, yes. So it, yeah, I understand. It, it can be done, but if provided the cost is lower. See, at present, we cannot make synthesize. We can design the chip, but we cannot manufacture the chip. Yes. It is a proprietary thing. Yeah. So we have to negotiate with the manufacturer. Can they develop the low cost, low density chips? So if it, if it happens, then we can go ahead with that. Otherwise, we use choose different platform, which, which is cheaper and which can accommodate lesser number of SNP. So depending on our purpose, we have to opt for the platform. And we have to negotiate with the uh, real guys which can do it. And they have huge margin. I, I'm sure you can do it in half the price of this thing. How is this information now being used for getting, you know, our local millets and, you know, because, I mean, similar challenges are coming up in that context. So yes. is this information being transferred to that kind of work and how is it happening? I'm just curious how it's uh, working out. Yes, ma'am, that's a very good question and that's what I was trying to allude to, that the same pipeline has to be used for other species also. So very limited amount of information can be directly transferred from rice to other species. Uh, we have to actually uh, take those millets and uh, make the genome. And so that was the challenge actually. The genome sequencing is probably where we need to sort of really be putting our efforts. So is, are there lessons from rice that can be used for uh, you know, creating the genome sequencing for these? Yes, uh, definitely. Because when we started in rice, it was around one dollar per, per nucleotide. Now it is less than a cent per nucleotide. And the technology has improved from clone by clone sequencing. Earlier we had to clone every DNA fragment before sequencing. Then the NGS came where the cloning was not necessary. It was replaced by PCR amplification and then sequencing. Now the third generation, which is PAC Bio and Oxford Nanopore, even PCR is not necessary. Just you take the DNA and sequence it. So original. So the cost has come down. Uh, so we have to prioritize actually. It's still, I think, it might take maybe about 50 lakh to conservative estimate if you want to sequence the genome of, say, uh, any millet to a high level quality. Draft genome you can do much cheaper. Even in 10 lakh you can have a draft genome, but the draft genomes are not so much useful. You need to have. Uh, Equicide has already done. Uh, not all the millets. They have done for the pearl millet and the sorghum was done in U.S. So all the crescent crops, the five mandated crops, the genome is available. But there are many minor millets are there, you know, like foxtail millet, uh, you know, and some akodo, uh, kurkise, all these things which are the nutrient cereals they are calling. So the genomes can be uh, assembled and it is necessary and it is not that costly now compared to what it was, you know, 20 years back. And then other is the resequencing. So we have to go in a more organized way and in a network mode. 
So we can pull, actually we are spending more, the more money actually as individually. But if you join hand, then these things can be done. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Uh, I have a very naive question. So when you insert a gene in, uh, in a given crop, let's say in rice, um, is there a concern uh, how it might affect other properties? Uh, so if you're gaining something, is it at the cost of something else? Or that is not a concern here? No, that's, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, quite often, when I talk here, uh, we are, normal breeders are doing like that. When they are taking, when they are crossing two varieties, and then one variety has one particular gene, the other variety doesn't have this, they cross it, and then basically it is allele replacement. Uh, use of, uh, inferior allele is uh, replaced by the superior allele. But along with that comes the linkage drag. So the, all those genes, if you transfer one gene, which may be 10 kb, 10,000 base pair, you normally transfer 3 million base pairs because of the, the whole chunk goes together. It cannot recombine because of very close pro proximity. But the, most of the time it is not a problem. But I showed you one problem where this dwarfing gene was introduced and simultaneously drought sensitive was also introduced because it was very tightly linked. So the normal breeding that is called negative linkage drag. But in case of if you do say genome editing, you, you have no linkage drag. But for genome editing, you need to have information about the gene, particular gene. And uh, sometimes the gene may have a pleiotropic effect. You transfer one gene, that, that gene will have a cascading effect if it is a regulatory gene. So sometimes it may be useful, sometimes it may be not useful. So we have to, you know, do it and see it. Uh, there is no general like thing prediction that it will be good or bad. That's why we have the testing and evaluation also. Two years of testing is mandatory before a new variety is released. But this gives us tools to go more precisely and uh, uh, improve the variety. That's why I told the backtrack building approach is that already we have very well established variety and we uh, put uh, one or two things or ten things. If we know precisely, then we can move ahead using this approach. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have more time. I'm sure there must be many more questions. You know, I, I wanted to ask this question because sometimes so you select a gene, you select a trait for gene, you might lose flavor. For ice, for example. You know, I remember I'm a jar from Punjab and I've grown, you know, with these uh, uh, with Punjab Agriculture University in Ludhiana where my brother used to go and get these things tested, soil. You know, when this new variety came, the wheat Mexican, it was bought long, long time ago, some yes. 40, 45 years ago, when we were young. And this, we were growing a lot of wheat in our, in our farms. So that new variety was reddish in color and smaller grain than yes. our uh, whitish uh, regular wheat. The yield was very high. So that to sell in the market, we would grow rest of the farm at half an acre. It would be the same our old white, you know, we have a white color wheat which we would keep for the whole year. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, the same thing whether you're selecting for one trade. You lose another sir, trade. That is things like rice, for example. You sir, know, that is true. Or Zona Basuri, for example. But if I can answer very briefly that, you know, we lose something because we did not select for it. We did not lose because, you know, we selected for dwarfing gene. That was not the reason we lost the quality and resilience. We lost the quality and resilience because we did not select for it. In fact, the genes are different genes for these different traits. So once we understand what the genes for the quality, then we can combine it with the high yield. So I showed you example for the doubt talents. Once we understood, then we, we recombined and transferred it. So many times it is a spurious correlation. Like, uh, you know, the blaming the green revolution that we lost the quality and all those things because we did not select for those things. We selected for the high input condition. We put a lot of water, a lot of fertilizer, and we made our selection in that condition. So we, we got what we selected for, and we lost which we did not select. Uh, uh, but now we have more tools to understand uh, what is responsible for the flavor, what is responsible for the yield, what is responsible for the quality, for the resilience. And then we can put one by one everything and combine with the yield also. So it is possible to combine high yield with high quality and all those things. But there's a lot of work needs to be done behind that. We need to understand which is the gene which is responsible for the aroma. Now, now you know, I can put aroma in Samba Masuri also if I want to. But many people don't, <laughs> don't like aroma. They like without aroma. So there's a lot of choice is available and a lot of science behind it, though it is just uh, you know, hard work and slow job.
Session. Uh, may I uh, take a uh, few minutes to thank all of them? Uh, actually, I would la like to thank our sincere gratitude to all these speakers and the eminent scientists present here. And you know, we were highly sensitized by all these speakers and their lectures. I wish the students could have uh, pres uh, present here. Uh, you know, uh, by the way, uh, uh, it would have. Uh, actually encouraged them to uh, take up research. Uh, so uh, it was great uh, hearing to all of you. Thank you so much uh, on behalf of INSA for uh, uh, you know, accepting our invitation. Thank you so much, thank you. And I, I would like to thank uh, the um, uh, NIO coordinators, Dr. Anmol and his team uh, over here. Um, who actually made uh, everything, uh, put it in order, means everything. And you know, without any technical glitch, we were uh, able to conduct this program here in this hall. Thank you so much for everyone. Pre uh, and you know, from here on, the proceedings will be happening there in YVS Auditorium. I would like to invite all of you to there for the next uh, proceedings. Thank you so much.